Well, I am at Riot Games headquarters right now, joined by Mark Merrill, co-founder of Riot Games, to talk a little bit about uh, the past and the future. Uh, great to have you here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's actually quite fun because we were planning on having this conversation a little bit before the 10-year anniversary announcement. Right. For world's reasons and logistics reasons, we weren't able to make it happen. But now we can actually talk about a bunch of the stuff that's been announced. Right. And well, I told you it would be better afterwards. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and so and now I believe you, yeah. uh, especially seeing everything that was announced. So uh, I think, you know, we were just talking beforehand, I think it's quite fun to look back at the past 10 years and then look forward to some of the stuff that's coming, yep. uh, which is, I think, what you guys uh, looked to do in that announcement. Mm -hmm. But first off, I mean... Congratulations on 10 years. Thank you. Uh, did you expect League to be in this position 10 years ago? We never expected League to be anywhere near the successful. So the first business model that Brandon and I worked on, our first financial model rather, uh, assumed 20,000 concurrent players. Um, you know, we're like, yes, then we would be break even and have a business. And, and uh, you know, of course, now we have, you know, tens of millions of players every month and whatnot and just these, these crazy numbers. And, uh, but beyond numbers, right, that's not the point. The, the thing that has been so meaningful with building Riot and you know, building League of Legends and whatnot has been seeing the impact it has on players all around the world. And so it's, it's been so gratifying to hear from players about how it's, the League has become an important part of their life or uh, some of the great friendships they've made or awesome experiences or it helped them get through a tough time. And you know, we hope that we have learned a lot through this experience over the last 10 years and that we will hopefully be bringing a lot of lessons to bear on the things we're going to be doing over the next 10. Yeah. What are some of the biggest surprises you've had, uh, even just related to League of Legends, the game, during this time and sort of where it's gone and what it's become? <laughs> I think one of the biggest surprises was that, um, that League worked. You know, like I think we had a lot of fear and doubt uh, that there would be a lot of players like us who wanted to play sort of, you know, deep competitive multiplayer games for such a long time and wanted to watch other people play them and whatnot. And so it's been, again, just sort of a special thing where we feel incredibly grateful to be able to contribute to eSports. And, uh, and you know, we love being part of the community. And so, uh, you know, Brandon and, my, and I, like, our favorite thing to still do these days is to play games with each other and with our friends as, like, our favorite pastime and activity. And I think that's the same thing that people that play League typically are really into, right? And so um, we know that there's still so many problems and so many opportunities to improve and all that, but uh, we definitely feel like we've come a long way. We feel like we've learned a lot, and we hope that we can continue to do a better job. Yeah. Well, I, I'm kind of curious if there are any big moments for you uh, just looking out over the past 10 years where, like, some of the major checkpoints are. You know, mm -hmm. for me, for instance, I remember right around the time I started covering League as an eSport, it was seeing the season one finals hit break 100k, I believe, right. uh, in viewership, and just sort of nowadays that's so standard, right? But right. Uh, that that stands out to me as this like really big moment where it was like, oh wait, this is potentially going to be a big thing. So mm -hmm. obviously, I come more from the esports side, so I'm kind of curious, just uh, holistically, what are those moments, the timeline for you look like? Yeah, so launching League of Legends at all was a big milestone for us because we had crazy development challenges prior to launch where, again, it was, you know, we thought that there were many chances where, where times where we may not even get League out the door at all. You know, we had to throw away our entire back-end technology platform at one point. We had less than two months of cash twice. Um, you know, and so the, the journey as an entrepreneur is often one fraught with fear. You know, it's fraught with crazy challenges. People are oftentimes criticizing you and doubting, you know, not only your capabilities, but the, you know, vision you have and whatnot. And so we've experienced a lot of criticism over the years for, you know, some of which, of course, is very valid um, for, you know, what we've tried to do with esports and with League and the business model initially. <clears throat> and so um, when League started to work and you know, players wanted to spend money in the game and they wanted to continue to play it and then esports became a thing. You know, I definitely think that, that some of those milestones come on big moments where there's opportunities for us to reflect. You know, and so, like, as an example, when we launched the Season 1 and created the Season Construct in the first place, that was two weeks before StarCraft II was going to launch. And so we were scared to death of StarCraft II because it's the sequel to the best PC game in the history of the world from the best game developer in the world that was coming with a map editor that they were going to monetize with the arcade system that was the successor to the map editor that birthed the genre that League of Legends was part of. 
So we were terrified of that, and so, you know, but launching draft mode and ranked and sort of announcing what we were doing at Jan Shipping Sweden, you know, at that early part of season one and creating that construct was a really important milestone when then StarCraft Two came out and like it didn't impact our numbers. We were like, oh my God, um, you know, taking over the European service from Goa uh, and then, you know, because North America was growing, but Europe was declining. And, and you guys and had a bunch of server issues over there, right? Uh, people, issues, most people yeah. won't know this, but at the time, you guys were working with a partner, right. and, and there were just tons of server issues, and you guys had to, to negotiate a way out of that, I think, is the, how well, that went? It was crazy to us, because servers would go down on, say, like Friday night and whatnot, and we'd, and we'd be like, when is the servers coming back up? And this is in European time, whatever. So we'd call them, and they're like, oh, yeah, well, we'll put them on again when the server guys get back on Monday. And it's like, what are you talking about, right? Our business is down. Players can't play. And even though like we weren't operating, it didn't matter, right? We wanted players to have a great experience for League of Legends. And so... That demonstrated that we clearly had not found the right partner, weren't delivering to player expectations, and so then we needed to figure out, all right, how do we get out of this situation? This is actually where we met Niccolo. So Niccolo, who's now the CEO of Riot, was the BD guy at France Telecom that, we, that did the deal with us to license the rights to League of Legends on behalf of Goa. We were able to then hire Niccolo. He then helped us unwind the deal and then launch our European entity in 45 days where we had to operate the game in four languages, hire people, build entities, you know, put servers in. While that was happening, the volcano exploded, you know, over Iceland, which shut down all air traffic. So we had to route servers and whatnot through the around Africa and all this craziness. And um, you know, meanwhile, we're on the forums talking to players, giving updates. And you know, I do think a lot of the trials and tribulations of Riot's early years helped form a deep belief in rioters around the mission of the company and around you know a lot of the values that we that we hold so dear and try to you know espouse and live up to. Um, and obviously, we don't always do that. But uh, you know, for anybody that's interested in some more of those you know, historical moments, we do have a documentary that just came out on Netflix now called League of Legends Origins that charts kind of the rise of League of Legends and, and some of the cool aspects of the community. Um, but that was really big. I think the Galen Center event was incredibly meaningful because you know, leading up to that, we're like, wow, like, it was, felt risky to run an eSport event at a big basketball arena. It's like, can we sell it out? we're likely to have two teams from Asia in the finals. Will North American fans predominantly, like one, will people travel? And then two, and fans in North America, are they going to have energy? And like, what will the vibe be like indoors? Are they going to cheer for the Taipei Assassins and for Azubu Frost? And, you know, when that started to work and the stick figure fighter videos went well and the donkey videos would happen and the orchestra went off and, you know, with the statues we handed out, although we had to scramble everywhere to go get, make sure everybody got statues because some people didn't know about them. And it's like, those were, those were just moments where like, wow, this is, this is this is gonna be a thing. Yeah, season I, season two finals. We should say I believe uh, 2013 or was it 2012? I think 2012. I think it was end of 2012. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. the next year was Staples. As, yeah, exactly. It's funny. It's interesting that it feels like I mean uh, the esports markers in a lot of ways. I feel like probably for you as you're telling these stories mean a lot. Like right. it, just because I think when you fill a stadium with fans and they're going so crazy. That is such a, a visible, tangible moment of right. the fandom around the game. Well, and prior, the semifinals for that Galen Center event was when we had to cancel the match between yeah. World Elite and CLG EU, where it was a seven hours League of Legends match to finish one game. You know, and that was that could have totally derailed the entire history of League of Legends esports. And so, you know, I do believe necessity is mother of invention, and all of those challenges I think forced the team and everybody at Riot to step up and figure out how do we do a better job to not disappoint our players. Um, you know, I think other moments that are really big inflection points have often been related to people, and those people then manifest in new competencies we have. So, like, when we did the first music video, you know, and, um, you know, or the first song we created it was really the Vi song, right? You know, with Nikki Taylor, you know, it's a Christian Link. Um, you know, it came to me and Brandon, and it's like, hey, Legal won't let me hire this 16-year-old singer to go do this song, but like we're creating this champion vibe, like I think that it would be appropriate to do this whole punk thing for her. Like, what do you think? And you know, we sort of talked to her, like, let's go figure out a way to make it happen. You know, and um, and then that, who knows? But like that little thing then led to the Jinx video, which then you know built all the videos we've done over time. You know, in terms of KDA or pop stars, and so a lot of the innovation, you know, that's happened to Riot, whether it's business model, whether it's esports, whether it's broader media stuff or music. You know, again, it's all driven by humans that care deeply, that are gamers, that want to share, you know, their craft and expertise and joy and passion with people. 
And so that's why it's rewarding when, you know, when we get positive feedback. And it's like, oh, it's working because people really work hard and really try. And we know that we you know, disappoint people, but we really try not to. You know, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was just the creative <laughs> side of the game because I think there have been a lot of areas where Riot has excelled, yeah. at esports side, uh, the game side, but it does feel like at times Riot has looked lost uh, on the creative right. side, right? Everything from the Journal of Justice yeah. back in the day. It had its charm. Yes, it did, it yeah. did. Um, but then it became like, okay, now actually we're gonna revamp all these bios, and then that would shift to a different strategy, a different strategy. Right. And so I think that was one of the things that really stood out to me when I was looking at the 10-year announcement and seeing that you guys were announcing Arcane, right. was, you know, has Riot finally got their feet underneath them after, you know, trying to figure out the creative direction for the company? Yeah, so I think the, the lens with which to understand all of those different sort of swings of the bat, if you will, and or vari variability in terms of quality is around, again, people. It's around competency development. It's around learning how to do things because creating things that are great is really hard. You need to have deep craft competency you know, and it's different, like the skills are different to go build a game and build a game engine and, guild, and bring, build tools versus design the game well versus make the game look really good, right? The, the art of League of Legends, even though it had cool style and charm and the characters were appealing early on, the craft was pretty poor. Over time, our art craft has gotten really, really good, which has been excellent. Similarly, our engineering capabilities have improved a lot. Similarly, you know, our, a lot of our creative capabilities. You know, early on when we were doing some storytelling with the Journal of Justice and we were doing experiments, essentially being like, what should this world be? We didn't know, right? And so um, originally we thought, like when League of Legends was just kind of going to be a small thing, we didn't want to invest a ton in the IP because the role of story in a competitive multiplayer game is setting. Right? Like think about Street Fighter originally. It's like, oh, like, you know, Ryu's from Japan. And, um, <clears throat> And so we thought some similarities like that, but then we realized players want to know more about these characters and who are they. And then we're like, all right, well, we got to retcon the whole IP because it doesn't make sense yeah. and it's not that cool. And especially if we want it to you know, create a foundation to tell stories in other mediums, other games, and things like that, it needs to evolve. But then how do you evolve it in a way that makes sense to players because it's a living, breathing game and people already have expectations. So that goes into the champion remakes, that goes into launch of the universe site, that goes into you know, redoing art assets over time. And then, but it's also, challenging for players when it's like, hey, I love Yorick, and now you give me a new Yorick, but I was already attached to the old one, right? We, you know, and sometimes I think we've done a poor job of honoring players' attachment to the things that we've done previously, even if from like every sort of production value aspect, the new thing is better. Um, you know, it's like we also, we never have to, we try to never lose sight of the fact that people still may be attached to whatever it is we're doing anyway, even while we're trying to be on this quest to improve. And so I think, People need to realize that all companies are are collections of humans, right? and then processes and tools and technology and whatnot to deliver a thing. And Riot has been learning how to do all this stuff in front of everybody's eyes, right? How to do global publishing, how to manage a global sport, how to run esports leagues, how to train, you know, journalists and build the right ecosystem and nurture you know, advertisers to want to come in and nurture teams, you know, while building a game, while building multiple games, while building a platform, while building a company. How do we even build a company? How do we organize? How do we keep everybody aligned? How do we keep people motivated? Like, these are all really hard problems. And, you know, so we don't bat a thousand, right? We make mistakes. And I think something that's really important for everybody to understand about learning is failure is part of learning. You try something that you're not sure is going to work or there's going to be risk. Sometimes you're going to get it wrong. And the important part of that is acknowledging your mistake, reflecting on it, being willing to understand why something didn't work out well, and then trying to go make it right. One <laughs> of the, the, I'm glad you brought this up because one of the things I want to talk to you about is just 2018, I look back on 2018 and I feel like that, to me at least, covering Riot and League yeah. was like the toughest year for Riot. Uh, you know, yeah. like the, the big thing around Clash, Yep. Uh, the I feel like LCS franchising st took a while to get going, uh, and then of course the public conversation that occurred around all the the diversity and inclusion issues at Riot. Yep. Uh, how uh, speaking uh, specifically to that one, you know, it was reported recently that there was going to be a ten million dollar settlement. Mm -hmm. I am curious from your perspective how how much progress do you think Riot has made in solving the issues that seem to be systemic within the company? So one, you know, I think that. Uh, 
ensuring that every individual has a great riot experience you know, is, I think it's a never ending quest. So we're never, we're never done, we're never out of the woods. You know, we've always tried to be a great employer. We've always tried to build, you know, an organization where people can come to their best work. And, you know, learning, in the, and especially in the manner that we did, you know, that many people felt that they didn't have the great ride experience that we were trying to deliver was a really tough thing. Um, and, you know, so one of the things that I'm very proud of, though, is how the company responded, you know, is how we've shared, like, you know, I think Riot, to the point around failure being an important part of learning, right, I think this was a test of character, right, which is are we the type of company that's going to acknowledge our mistakes and share progress and figure out how do we go get to excellent and how do we do that and let's involve excellent resources, let's get every rioter involved, be like, everything's on the table, do we like our values, do we not, how should we work, should we adjust, you know, and, and then we shared a lot of that progress and a lot of the changes and a lot of the updates publicly because, um, you know, that's, who we need to be as a company. That's the company rioters expect us to be. And, uh, but yeah, from a personal standpoint, I think from a riot standpoint, um, it was probably the hardest year we've gone through for lots of reasons. Um, you know, and, but again, I think that, I think that the, the quest of being a great company, being a great employer, doing great things for players, um, and being incredibly inclusive is something that we're always gonna need to continue to work at. You know, hearing you say that uh, you think that journey is unending, I think that's that's good to hear. But how do you feel this past year has gone in terms of of building this uh, path and making sure that you know the goal of making sure everyone feels comfortable here is accomplished? So yeah, so I think we're making great progress, um, and you know, and we measure that and we benchmark ourselves relative to other companies. And from a lot of dimensions, we're we're doing incredibly well. Um, you know, and so, and I think, you know, as it relates to, you know, you mentioned the settlement and, and things like that, like, we're trying to own our mistakes, right, and pass, and so, and even without getting into any of the details about, you know, about specifics, in a lot of ways, it doesn't matter. It's just, let's, like, if we're not excellent, let's go be excellent, and let's move forward and learn and improve and set new standards on a going forward basis and try to heal, you know? And, you know, I think, again, a failure is a key part of learning. People learn from mistakes and from challenges. And so, and people heal through redemption, right? And through, like, we're trying to help everybody learn how to have high quality interactions. We're a creative organization. We need the best people in the world to operate in a psychologically safe environment where we have teams that can trust and can take risks and can do all these incredibly challenging things we're trying to do. And that's hard, you know, and we, and we have to, tra and we grew fast. So we had to train thousands of people on how to do that and train managers and leaders all around the world on how to, you know, how, you know, a one size fits all approach is not great for everybody, right? And, you know, needing to customize and tailor based on people's different backgrounds and whatnot. And that's, that's been something that, again, we've, we've recognized we needed to really get better at. And so, you know, and I hope over time we'll all look back at this whole saga as you know a key inflection point that helped the company become closer to the the aspirational company we always have wanted to be and i just wanted to to ask for clarification when you say it doesn't matter and you said in a sense it doesn't matter mm -hmm. what uh, specifically were you referring to doesn't matter what doesn't matter is so what i yeah what i mean by that is the details of or circumstances right or sort of like without getting into legal cases or whatnot, facts matter, right? About what happened or not happened and, and things like that, you know, in a under a legal standard framework. But from a macro standpoint, around, <clears throat> you know, are we being the company we want to be? That's an easy answer, right? Which is assuredly no, right? And so from that lens, let's go learn how to be excellent, mm -hmm. right? But without even getting bogged down to the details of specific, you know situations because um, right, that's why there's a court system, right? That's why there's, uh, you know, mechanisms for people to have grievances and to, you know, get damages and the whole thing. And so, again, what we're trying to do is own any issues that have happened or, in a, and also if people have never even come forward with certain things, right? It's just like, we're trying to say, no matter what has happened, Let's try to heal, let's try to move forward, let's try to learn, let's go try to, let's try to, you know, we know we're not going to solve or justify or, or make anything right that where somebody had a bad experience. 
Um, but how do we move forward, right? And because I think that's the only thing you can do as an individual, as a team, as a company. And you know, so that's what we've really been trying to do is get better, is learn and improve and move forward. Gotcha. Well, to then not make the same mistakes in the past, right? And yeah. to help people be able to have, a, a, I think, the incredible right experience that many, many have had. Well, looking transitioning from the past and starting to look forward, you guys announced many different games uh, on that day. Yep. I would love to ask you, um, why did you decide to just pile everything into this one moment? Because it's actually something as I was watching from <laughs> at like in two a.m. in Germany or where, you know, where I was for Worlds. I was thinking about, man, this is just so much. I had not actually seen something similar from a single game uh, developer before. Uh, so what uh, made you want to pack everything into that one moment? Yeah, so the, the thought process behind that was we think a lot of people, I don't think, understand what Riot truly is or who the company is or how we make decisions or whatnot. And there's sort of a lot of misinformation or misperception, which is okay, right? Brand trails execution. Like our view is we never wanted to come out and say we're cool or trying to do all these things. We wanted to do cool things for players and try to let our results speak for themselves. Um, and, you know, but one of the challenges when we're bringing out new games and new genres, there are many players that don't know anything about Riot or don't know anything about League or they have a negative impression of League for whatever reason. You know, and so, but if we wanted players to understand that Riot is going to be committed to trying to deliver an incredible game in the genres that we're, that we're going into, and we're going to do it in a way that we you know, sort of approached League of Legends in the past, meaning, you know, for whatever that means to people, um, <clears throat> we thought that helping people understand more of all the things they've been working on would give people a more complete picture. And because there's a lot of similarities between the sort of approach and philosophy that have underlined the games we've chosen to go make. Uh, we're trying to make impossible player dreams come true in all these different areas, right? And we're going to be committed to that for a long time. And so in the MOBA context, right, that meant doing the business model the way we did and the live updates that we did and investing in esports the way we have and adding lots of characters and investing in the IP and all that, right? In a tactical shooter context, that's going to mean different things. Like in the video where we we're announcing Project A, right, we referenced, you know, competitive integrity. We referenced, you know, servers with high tick rates. We, you know, mentioned solving a lot of network issues, right? Um, not to mention, of course, the gameplay needs to be incredible and the characters need to be awesome and all that. You know, so we're, the, the products are differentiated, right? And, but they're, just like League of Legends, we're not trying to build something for everybody, right? They're trying to be really good at solving meaningful problems for the audience that they're built to serve. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do. And I think that's why we tried to celebrate the League 10 year where we're doing all these things. Because even if you don't like Legends of Runeterra or you didn't want a card game from us or whatever, maybe you're going to like Project A. Or even if you're not into that, maybe you're going to like Project L. You know, maybe you're in the fighting game community. Which is also why, you know, we had Tom Cannon even announce that he was doing that at Evo, right? Because they're the founders of Evo, right? And so he thought it was incredibly important to be able to tell or give the news first to the fighting game community because he owed it to them, right? And, you know, Riot wants to be the type of company that is able to do that, right? We didn't make the tenure about mainstream press. Or we're trying to talk directly to players. And, you know, it's just that's hard to do as the surface area increases, right? We operate in 19 languages. We operate all over the world. That's why we had to do all these global events, and we, try, we need to get every rider involved to, get, to try to say thank you to players. And so, you know, those things are, they take a lot of coordination. They, they, you know, they're difficult to pull off. But I think that type of event can only be pulled off by a company like Riot that's actually staffed full of people who love players and love games and want to say thank you. Um, and, you know, hopefully, hopefully we're going to deliver. And the good news is, like, I'm more confident in that because I've played the games, and they're freaking awesome. If you're into that type of thing, right? And again, I don't, we're not going to please everybody with everything, you know, but I think they're definitely going to find an audience. I think we're going to be proud of them, and that's what we're trying to do. Well, and that's, I, I'm glad that you brought up the fact that you've played them because that was sort of what we had heard as you, you guys stepped down from the day to day running of the business, you and, and Brandon, yeah. uh, to actually work on these games. So, how much have you both been involved in building these out? Well, so we built all the teams uh, and worked with the teams to initially set the vision and whatnot. And then over time, typically as the games become more and more baked and they move more and more into production, where you kind of know what you're making, then our involvement decreases um, because the team kind of knows what it's doing, right? And it's scaled and it solved a lot of problems and all that. And then it's more sort of feedback and iterative stuff over time and more strategy. Um, you know, but one of the 
things that's been fascinating as the company's grown, you know, I used to say that, hey, it's a marathon, not a sprint, so we have to pace ourselves. And I realized that that was an incorrect metaphor. It's more of a series of infinite consecutive sprints because we work hard and we've been trying, right? And every sprinter knows you can't sustain infinite sprints, right, infinitely. You need to rest, you need recovery. And I think one of the things that Brandon and I are, are sort of, we can do a better job for the company when we hand over a lot of the day-to-day -day operations you know, to a team that has helped build the company, that is better at operating than we are in a lot of ways, and where we can go focus on some of the things that I think we're good at relating to helping people understand why we're here, right? And purpose and mission and culture and strategy and product, which is, you know, because that's what we love to do. Yeah. Uh, to speaking of the card game, you mentioned everything is going to find an audience. Uh, Legends of Runeterra, which I've played and I've enjoyed. Yeah. I do just wonder how you look at that market right now, because it does feel like uh, with the advent of Hearthstone and then Magic, all these these card games hit for a while, and it feels like as a genre, there's yep. been speculation that that genre is trending away. Mm -hmm. um, and I think even Elder Scrolls recently announced that maybe they were going to stop updating the game as much or so something to that effect. Yep. Uh, how confident are you that Runeterra can survive in a world where perhaps the card game genre is maybe not as popular as it once was? Yeah, so we take a lot of the traditional sort of industry metrics or, not, or sort of perspective with a big grain of salt. Um, not to say that there's anything inherently, that there's, there's a massive flaw, but you know, back in the late 2000s when League of Legends was launching, the whole meme in the industry was that PC gaming is dead. You know, and it's all about consoles and whatever. And then it's all about social games, all about mobile games and whatnot. And fast forward, right, PC gaming is incredibly healthy. Uh, and League is bigger than it's ever been 10 years in. You know, so um, I think that it, it, like to use another business metaphor, right? When you think about ride sharing and, and sort of Uber, you know, when people would size the taxi market, they'd be like, okay, here's the rough taxi market size in all the different countries in the world, right? In all the different cities, and therefore it's this, you know, $30 billion industry, whatever it is. And then you're like, yeah, but what happens if you do, you deliver such a great experience, many more people actually want to use it? And then all of a sudden, oh, well, the market has gone up 10x or whatnot. And so, not to say that we're going to 10x the card game market with Legends of Runeterra, but the point is that. There's a lot of reasons as to why people may not have, you know, found joy in card games, right? Or why the reach in a particular region hasn't been as penetrated as maybe it could be, right? Or why people have churned out over time. And a lot of those decisions, or what we perceive to be some of those reasons, are things that we've intentionally tried to build into Legends of Runeterra that we think are different. So, like one of the like again, I played five thousand games of Hearthstone. I love the game. I played a ton of Magic. Um, <clears throat> but it feels bad that you know it's a tunnel on one competitive deck that also costs you eighty dollars. They also can't do live balance or iterate on because you know if you spent a ton of time chasing, you know, Doctor Boom, if the developer's nerfing to you know or iterating on the live balance to make the meta less stale or to fix some of the issues, it's like well, that that's less they're less easily able to do that when people have spent an awful lot of money, right? In Magic, that's why they solve it with stats because it's four hundred dollars for a competitive deck. But then you're only tunneling again on one deck, whereas color pie variation, you know, or class variation in the case of Hearthstone is one of the most interesting things, you know, about card games. And so we want people to have lots of card access in. And then we also think that there's also opportunities to not just make the core method of playing the game just beat your head against the rank grind ladder, right? So think Clash in League of Legends, right? I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity to evolve how people play games and sort of what the default mode is, and that can manifest in all of our games going forward. And so anyway, um, like, we never anticipated that League of Legends would be able to have 100 million players around the world. So I think market sizing <coughs> is, especially based on traditional metrics, is oftentimes leads people to make incorrect assumptions. Like, when we were thinking about building our own office in Korea to launch League of Legends, you know, and we're talking to all the publishers in Korea, you know, like, so NCSoft or, or Nexon or whatnot, they'd be like, okay, so RTS is this size of the market, you know, and you know, MOBAs would probably be this subset of a percentage of the art test market, and therefore, you're maybe in a success case, you're going to have this percentage of the MOBA market, therefore, we should pay you X, right? And it's like, okay, well, and now, you know, 10 years in, right, we're, what, 50% market share in Korea and sustaining? It's, it's absurd. You know, like, so, sometimes you can do things that totally defy reason and logic, and League of Legends has been able to do that. I don't think all of our games are going to have the same type of disruptive impact as League of Legends, or on the same scale, because, but that's not even the goal. <coughs> but I do think within particular genres of communities, we're not going to do a game unless we're pretty confident. It's going to bring something meaningful to the table that is going to enhance the experience of people that are into that. 
So, and who knows what the impact of those things can be, is what I'm essentially saying. Yeah. I have played a tremendous amount of TFT. Uh, I actually hit Diamond 3 in TFT, and normally I suck at video games. I don't know what that says about TFT or about me, but I am uh, very curious. You do not call TFT a game. Um, and this is strange to me because when I play TFT, it feels tremendously different than League of Legends. Sure. Um, what What is the reasoning behind TFT not being a game or having been one of these game releases? So one is, you know, you launch TFT still through the League of Legends executable. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, you know, even though it's its own gameplay and it's its own game and whatnot, it's because it's kind of, it's like a sister product of League of Legends. So, you know, there's like a significant Venn diagram overlap. Um, but over time, I think it's, I think it really is sort of earning its own slot as a different game and whatnot. But we kind of joke about that where uh, because it happened so quickly and whatnot too, it's, it's, it, it wasn't the like, the thing that I think all of the company was like, yeah, that's when the S in games is finally going to happen. See that, and that's what it's my really curious, that. that's what my curiosity was, was like yeah. how much of it not becoming a game in of itself is because you had been working on all these games for so long and then some <laughs> guys go into a corner, build this thing in three months and put it out. And right. I didn't know if that was one of the, the major reasons why it, it didn't get the game's title. Well, it's, it's essentially getting the game's title, right? And, and But this is also goes to the thing around internal vocabulary. Yeah. Um, that, that's a whole challenge, but like different teams have different acronyms or different refer to things differently and whatnot, and, and getting alignment for everybody about how to call or call what things is, is important. But I think TFT is a great example of entrepreneurship, right? Entrepreneurship happening internally to a company, um, you know, where Richard Hankel and the team, I think, did a phenomenal job and being like, hey, like, we love this type of game experience. We think we can go do a great job. And, you know, we're empowered to go do something quickly with, you know, without a lot of constraints. Um, and, you know, did an awesome job. And so, you know, but just like League, right, TFT, I think, is still in its infancy. You know, we're now in a set two, but I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for it to continue to grow. And, you know, I think that's an important lens with which to look at all of our games. You know, the first iteration of the game is just, that's the launch is the start, it's not the end. Yeah. Do I have your permission to start calling TFT a game? Go for it. Okay, thank God. Yeah. Uh, because you said it's its own executable, but I'm like, but it is going to come to mobile, yeah, and that will exactly. be its own executable. Right. Uh, so it's a game. It's, it kind of doesn't matter. Yeah. Right? Just like if people call in eSports a sport or whatever, right. who cares? You know, it's like lots of people like to watch it. Uh, the, I'm, I'm also kind of curious. You, you mentioned it's going to mobile. Do you have, it's kind of a mix of, of the past and the present, but uh, do you have any regret that the company took so long to create a mobile product in League? Um, <clears throat> yes and no, right? So one, part of why Riot has been so successful is because of our focus. And, you know, a lot of people, I think, prior to the League 10-year anniversary, right, made the incorrect assumption that the company sort of got fat and lazy or whatnot. It was just, you know, continually invest in League, and that was all we are going to do. Um, meanwhile, we are doing a lot of things, right? And so one of the challenges or questions I think we'd ask ourselves is, like, should we go bring League to mobile? It's like, well... Maybe, however, what's the opportunity cost, or let's evaluate that based on what other incredible mobile game should we make? Right? If we could make anything, why make League on mobile versus doing something else? And <clears throat> that's also because a lot of the decisions about what we prioritize, why not, again, it's not driven from what's the thing that can go make the most money, and therefore let's go do that. Right? So we were skeptical that we could deliver a sufficiently high quality League of Legends type experience on mobile. The mistake that we made was we didn't sufficiently explore it. So we didn't do enough R&D around control scheme and things like that. Subsequently, as that innovation you know, uh, was sort of brought to bear, <clears throat> and we re-looked at, is there a way to bring a genuine League of Legends experience to mobile, we figured out, you know what, we think we can. And, and that's what Wild Rift is. And it's actually super fun and it's really cool. And we're surprised at that, like, to be totally honest. Um, and so, but we're excited, and we think our players are going to be excited too. And we also, we didn't want to make a game that was going to cater to some region, right? Like, when we make a thing, it has to be something that can work all around the world. And again, I think that's another difference between maybe how Riot thinks about things compared to other companies. Does that mean that the League of Legends Team Manager product that's only coming to China right now will come to the West at some point in time? Maybe. Okay, <laughs> I just I just ask because I would like to play that game. That would stand, and to it reason. is only coming to a certain region. And you just mentioned you don't do that, so right. That, so that would stand to reason under that philosophy. Okay, good. 
uh, I hope that philosophy continues. Anyway, uh, I'm do you, looking at TFT and how quickly that team was able to put that out. Looking yeah. at uh, Mobile Rift, uh, sorry, um, Wild Rift, Wild Rift, yeah. uh, and seeing that that was something that you did not think previously would be an experience that could perhaps be excellent. Has that have those two products uh, changed the attitude internally at all on the types of ways that you go into new games and the assumptions you make before you get into them? For sure. Um, and I think in a really healthy way, right? So like we think that there's a lot of value that is created through social friction, right? And through different people with different ideas. Like we don't think anybody has a monopoly on truth. And so um, there's lots of spirited debates over time about what type of games to make or which ones would resonate or why and on what platforms or whatnot. And now I think everyone's coming to consensus like, oh, you know what? It like we can as long as we can deliver a great experience on a particular platform and it's it sort of like feels like it's natively great for that platform, of course we should do that if it makes sense, right? And so I think a lot of assumptions that you know maybe have been um, you know have existed in the past have been are sort of unwinding and there's a lot of things that we're continuing to explore. Yeah. Well, I just finally want to ask you about Riot Forge, which got announced in this past yep. week. Yep. Uh, and uh, as we record this, I'm about to go to the Game Awards and see for the first time what the first game is going to be that gets announced underneath That's this. why you're looking so sharp. Yes. That's what I said whenever I walked in the room. I said, this is not for you. This is for the Game Awards. Uh, I just, okay. I didn't want you to think I dressed got up it. for you. It's very now important. I'm, now I feel slighted. Yes. Great. That's what I was going for. <laughs> um, but uh, Riot Forge, what was the idea behind this? Because... Um, in the past, I feel like Riot has been, especially because of the early days with partners you chose, nervous to partner up with companies in general. Uh, right. For a long time, it was like, well, we could partner or we'll just build a giant merchandise company within ours. Or we could partner right. or we'll build a giant network infrastructure. Um, so why, what has made you feel comfortable now going and uh, working with other game devs? So a lot of it relates to the maturity of the necessary functions. So <clears throat> the reason that Riot had to cultivate a lot of competencies internally that historically, or like in an ideal world, you'd partner with or buy from other companies, um, was in order to deliver the type of experience that we thought players really want, the market generally didn't support that vision, right? Like when we go to ESPN or some of the other third-party esports tournament organizers originally, and you know, we're talking about league structures and you know, making them more watchable and teams that are, you know, have a published schedule in advance, all these things, nobody, you know, there wasn't the ability to deliver that experience based on yeah, the market. So, we're, so through that lens, we're tough to partner with. In Korea, we partner with OGN, right, because that infrastructure existed. So we have no bias against partnering. It's just we're hard to partner with when we don't want to compromise on the experience we're trying to deliver. The same thing is true with Forge. Like, we'd love for players to go play lots of games in League IP, but we needed to nurture the IP in such a way and mature our platform and mature our company in such a way where we had the capability and bandwidth to support third-party developers in the right way. And where it's like, we need to know Ash, like just like Disney could be great at managing their IP and allowing you know, certain third parties to work with it or, or other, you know, say, you know, other great IP holders, there's a competency necessary to be developed to help people work within the constraints of that IP that we had to go develop. And so we feel like we're in a much better place now that can unlock that opportunity. And Riot will continue to focus on you know, few big games, you know, we're only going to say a handful every decade, but hopefully when we do, they're going to mean something, right? And it's going to be more than a game and, you know, hopefully really add something to the genre. But with Forge, right, we think we can, like, we'd love players to have all these completable games that are super cool where developers that are great at doing certain things or certain type of experiences can work with us to delight our players in other ways, right? Um, and so, you know, we've been thrilled about the response from developers, uh, you know, and we hope, you know, we look forward to seeing players' reactions to some of the first things that we're going to show. The players' reactions to the announcement, uh, some of the top comments on uh, the, the League of Legends subreddit was yep. uh, League of Legends MMO on its way. <laughs> uh, you know, I think they had not read the fine print around this is more like single-player experiences, but... Right. Uh, yeah, we would not do that out of house. Okay. You know, because that type of thing, right, in order to do it justice requires the best teams in the world, right, which probably doesn't exist in a third-party developer, right? We'd have to cultivate that in-house. It'd take a long time, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. It'd be, you know, that's a thing. Is it a, a something that you'd consider doing? You've tweeted this before, and you started this huge thing, and I'm sure annoyed all of your comms people. So I'm just kind of curious. I, I think post L10, the comms people understand now why. Okay. You know, and so, which is cool. Like, you know, 
where we think it's good for players to say, Riot, please go make an X. Because why, like that, so why not, right? So I, I would love to make an MMO, right? Um, the, the, just to manage expectations though, if we were to do something like that, it, you know, it wouldn't be soon. Uh, these things are incredibly hard to make. Anybody that's ever built an MMO deserves a medal. It's like shipping a freaking rocket. Like it is so much work, it is so hard to do, and we would try to really do it justice, right? And that's not easy. Yeah. So. All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for uh, coming in. Uh, uh, coming in. I came into your office. But is there anything that you want to say to any of the fans? I mean, people have been playing your your games and following your company for over a decade now. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, I guess the, the main thing I'd say is just thank you. Um, you know, I think one of the cool things about milestones or anniversaries or whatnot, and League of Legends 10-year anniversary, you know, it still recently happened. Uh, it's a great moment to reflect and to look back and to, and to say thank you. And, um, you know, I just I feel a tremendous amount of gratitude to every player of League. And, and um, you know, I hope we're going to, we as a company are going to continue to do, uh, you know, a better and better job of, of living up to your expectations for us, not only with League, but across all these different games. Um, so we appreciate your trust and faith and, uh, you know, and passion. And so, yeah, thank well, you. Thank you so much, Mark, for the interview. For everyone else, you can check out the rest of my coverage of all things League of Legends, Riot Games, and more right here on my YouTube channel. Happy eSports holidays here from Travis Gafford Industries. You know what we would love in our stocking, under our tree, under our, I don't know, any number of different holiday traditions? you to subscribe to the YouTube channel because we're getting close to 200K. I don't think we can do it this year, but it would help me a lot if you subscribe. That's a great gift for me. Uh, that's what I have on my wish list, just more YouTube subscribers. And what you should have on your wish list is almost dropped it off my couch. Uh, this Alienware M15, you can check it out at Alienware, uh, or sorry, Alienware.com slash Travis. There's a link in the video description. Uh, they've got a bunch of other stuff over there too. Monitors, desktops, peripherals. Go check them out. That super helps me. Just click the link. Take a look.